At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Part 1 You will hear a customer asking for help in a shop. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Excuse me, where are the dresses? They're at the end of this aisle, on the left. Can I help you with anything? Yes, maybe. I'm not from around here, so I don't know this store. Well, I can help you with anything you need. Fantastic. I'm actually down here for my brother's wedding, and I need something to wear. I've just started a new job, and I haven't had time to get anything yet. I'm looking for something smart. Maybe a new dress. Well, what about this one? I think it's too hot for long sleeves. Yes. Well, uh, this one has shorter sleeves, and it still has the bow, which I think is a nice detail. Uh, or there's this patterned one. I'm not keen on a pattern. I think I'll go for the one with the bow. Do you have it in a size 10? Let me have a look. Uh, yes, here. Great. I need a hat, and then I can try them on together. What kind of hat are you looking for? What about this one with the flower? Yes, but if I may suggest, a taller hat would add to your height. Really? Yes. Try this one. Oh, I see what you mean. We have this style with the single flower. Or with a small bunch, and it comes with a, a wide or narrow brim. I like the narrow brim and just the one flower. Hmm, can I have a blue flower? I'm afraid it just comes in cream. Well, it goes with the dress anyway. Great. I'll place an order and have the hat sent to you. It'll take about two days to be delivered. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. I need to take down a few details for delivery. Can I take your name? Ellen Barker. And the delivery address? It'll be my brother's address. It's 15... No, uh, 14 Brightwell Avenue. 14... Uh, can you spell that, please? Yes. B-R-I-G-H-T-W-E-L-L -L Avenue. Staybridge, Kent, D-A-4-7-D-F. And can I take a contact number? Yes. My mobile is 03221774. 03221775. No, it's a four at the end. Oh, sorry. I've got it now. We can deliver on May the 12th. We can't specify an exact time, just morning or afternoon. Any time in the early morning is fine. And how would you like to pay? Visa. Great. That comes to £32.25. OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. I'm just going to try this dress on and then look for shoes. Where are the changing rooms? They're to the left of the store, right next to customer services. And I want some shoes and accessories too. Where can I find them? The accessories are in the women's wear department. The shoe department is right at the front of the store, between men's wear and home furnishings. Oh, 
no, sorry, <laughs> we've just moved the shoe department for the summer season. It's now very near the changing rooms, actually, straight in front of them. Thanks so much for your help. And where can I pay for the other things? The cash desk is at the front of the store, by the menswear. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages. And I've got a number of facts, tips and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly 10,000 years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type, light beer, contains no more than 2% alcohol, and the highest may reach 6%. Other drinks, such as wine, are more alcoholic. Wine contains 8 to 20% alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. 
No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption. And the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavor. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain even on the list of big consumers, actually the Czech Republic consumes the most beer, at 156 litres per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Sharon and Zhao Li, talking to their tutor about a presentation they gave the previous week. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. So, Sharon and Zhao Li, in your presentation last week, you were talking about the digital divide, the gap between those who can effectively use communication tools, such as the Internet, and those who can't. And you compared the situation here in Northern Ireland with Southeast China. Right, so... I asked you to do some self-evaluation, watching the video of your presentation and thinking about the three main criteria you're assessed by, content, structure and technique. What do you think was the strongest feature of the presentation when you watched it? Uh, Sharon? Well, I was surprised actually because I felt quite nervous, but when I watched the video it didn't show as much as I expected. So which of the criteria would that come under? Uh, confidence? Mm, that's not actually one of the criteria as such. Zhaoli? Technique? It's body language and eye contact, isn't it? Well, I didn't think I looked all that confident, but I think that our technique was generally good, like the way we designed and used the PowerPoint slides. Hmm. So you both feel happiest about that side of the presentation? Yeah. Hmm. OK, uh, now on the negative side, uh, what would you change if you could do it again? Well, at first I'd thought that the introduction was going to be the problem, but actually I think that was OK. We defined our terms and identified key issues. It was more towards the end. The conclusion wasn't too bad, but the problem was the questions. Mm. We hadn't really expected there'd be any, so we hadn't thought about them that much. Uh -huh. OK, uh, anything else? Well, like Zhao Li says, I thought the conclusion was OK, but when I watched this on the video, I thought the section on solutions seemed rather weak. Hmm. Can you think why? Well, we explained what people are doing about the digital divide in China and Northern Ireland, but I suppose we didn't really evaluate any of the projects or ideas. It was just a list. And that was what people were asking us about at the end, mostly. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. OK. Now, I also asked you to get some peer evaluation from the other students. Yes. Uh, well, people said it was interesting, like the fact that in China, the Internet was used more for shopping than in Northern Ireland. They said sometimes it was a bit hard to understand because we were talking quite fast, but we didn't think so when we watched the video. No, it's a bit different, though, because you know all this information already. Mm. If you're hearing it for the first time, you need more time to process it. That's why signposting the structure and organisation of the talk is important. That seemed OK. No one mentioned that as a problem. Some people said that we could have had more on the slides, like some of the other groups had nearly everything they said written up on the visuals as well. Hmm. But other people said the slides were good. They had just the key points. Yes. And most people said we had quite good eye contact and body language. They all pointed out we'd overrun. They all said we were five minutes over. But we timed it afterwards on the video, and it was only three minutes. We were a bit unsure about the background reading at first, but I think we did as much as we could in the time. Anyway, no one commented on that under content. But one thing that did come out was that they liked the fact we'd done research on both Northern Ireland and China. Most other people had just based their research on one country, we managed to get quite a lot of data from the internet, although we had to do our own analysis, and we did our own surveys as well in both countries. So the class gave us best feedback for content, but it was all OK. Right. Well, that's quite similar to the feedback I'm giving you. I was very impressed by the amount of work you'd done and by your research methodology. So, actually, I'm giving you full marks for content. Five. Oh. <laughs> The structure of the presentation was good, but not quite as good as the content. So, I gave that four, and the same for technique. So, well done. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> now, the next stage is to write up your report. So, just a few pointers for you here. First of all, in your presentation, I think your ending was rather abrupt. You suddenly just stopped talking. Yeah. It wasn't a big problem, but think about your closing sentences in your report. You want to uh, round it off well. Mm. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was that I felt a very strong point was that after you'd given your results, you explained their limitations. The fact that we didn't have a very reliable sample in terms of age in China. Yes, that section. So don't forget to include that. Mm. And you had some excellent charts and diagrams. But maybe you could flesh out the literature review a bit. I can give you some ideas for that later on, if you want. OK, uh, is there anything else you want to ask? Um, no, no, thank you. Thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Lake Akraman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding 
unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire and tsunami, the giant waves formed by major earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometres across and travelling at around 90,000 kilometres an hour slammed into an area of red volcanic rock about 430 kilometres northwest of Adelaide. Within seconds, the meteorite vaporised in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometres deep and 40 kilometres in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 metre height tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometres away. Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Ackerman, the arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.